All right. Hey, good morning, everybody. If we haven't met before, uh, my name's David. Um, my wife and I and our kids, we've been coming here for uh, about eight years or so, eight and a half years or so. So it's a gift to be with you this morning. Last week uh, was Mother's Day. And so this week, we're following up with the, the logical next subject, which is death and burial, uh, which this is where we ended up here. So any of you guys, show of hands, any of you give much thought to death, burial, any of you written a will, any of you told your loved ones what you want to have happen to you, all that stuff, they're probably going to ignore it, but maybe helpful to tell them anyway. Um, as we talk about death and burial, I, I, I like to say I have two requests when I die. Number one, I want my remains spread throughout the beautiful British countryside. And number two, I do not, under any circumstances, want to be cremated. Um, <laughs> why should the cremated people have all the fun, right? It's like, okay, uh, they get to sprinkle themselves. What if I just want a finger over there, a leg over there, put one of my legs in a vase on top of my child's... Uh, fireplace or something like that. Um, <laughs> but here we are, we're in Romans chapter 6, if you have your Bible. So Romans 6, we're going to be reading the first 14 verses. If you're looking for a logical reason why I would open with that joke, there won't be one, but it's, um, it at least somewhat tangentially connects to this. So Romans 6, uh, if you're new here to Vintage, we've been moving through the book of Romans over the last six months or so. And here we find ourselves in chapter 6. Verse 1 begins like this. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. Just as Christ was raised from the dead... By the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin." And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have new life." So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. So as we step into Romans chapter 6, in essence, what we are reading from Paul is that the Easter story that we celebrated just a few weeks ago, that is the the crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, Romans 6 is teaching us that the Easter story is not only the story of Jesus, but it is also the story of us. That for those of us who have chosen to follow Jesus, to those of, him, those of us who have declared Him as our Lord, that this journey of crucifixion, burial, death, and resurrection is the invitation that He has for us. Now, make no mistake, this is a radical message. If you think that following Jesus is a safe or simply predictable journey, then you're following the wrong Lord because the, the gospel of Jesus is a radical message. The word radical 
comes from this word meaning root. It's where we get the word radish from, right? A radish is this root vegetable. So when I say radical, I mean the opposite of something that is shallow and surface level. This is a message that is about going deep into the very tradition of the story that God has been writing from even before the foundation of the world. So it's like C.S. Lewis writes of Aslan, who is that Christ figure, of when one of the children says, is he safe? And the response is, no, he's not safe, but he is good. That Romans 6 is, is inviting us into this radical pursuit of Jesus, this radical life of crucifixion, of death and burial, and of resurrection in our spiritual lives as we pursue him. This morning, I want to highlight for us and emphasize what it looks like to follow him into, uh, figuratively, spiritually, follow him into crucifixion, follow him into death and burial, and then follow him into resurrection. This passage in 14 verses, we see the word death or a derivative of death layer throughout this passage. It is setting the backdrop against which we see that it says that by the glorious power of the Father, He, that is Jesus, was raised from the dead. But Romans chapter 6 verses 1 and 14 is this reminder for us about the death that comes when we are under the power of sin. And it is the backdrop against which the life, the transformative life of Jesus rises up to say that death no longer has power over him, that his death was about breaking the power of sin, that what, that death would no longer, that sin and death would no longer be your master. We see this journey played out in the people of Israel, right? Thousands of years ago, the people of Israel find themselves in Egypt where they have been slaves for over 400 years. But on the first Passover that is given to the people, declared by Moses, or by God through Moses, on that first Passover night, they take, every one of the Israelite families takes an unblemished lamb, takes the blood of that lamb, and puts it on their doorposts. It is this picture of the crucified life. Jesus will be called the Lamb of God. So this unblemished lamb is a picture of Jesus. They take the blood, put it on their doorposts, and that night when the angel of death passed over that nation, those who were covered by the blood were spared the death and destruction that came to the Egyptians. It is so devastating that Pharaoh comes then to Moses and the people of Israel and says, get out from here. Get out. And so the million or so people of Israel are ready to run. They run towards their freedom, run away from Egypt, and come up against a barrier, which is the Red Sea, this ocean between them. And that is where God parts the ocean, and the million of them begin to walk through from a land of slavery to a life of freedom. Corinthians will later say that that picture of them passing through the Red Sea is a picture of baptism. And so in Romans 6, when it says that you were crucified with Christ, that is the blood over the doorpost, then it says, do you not know, have you forgotten that you were buried with him in baptism? It is that picture of a people after 400 years leaving slavery and stepping into a life of freedom. And as they get through the Red Sea, surrounded by these walls of water, they get onto the other side, and by that point, the Egyptians have started pursuing them again, because as Romans 6 will teach us, sin is seeking to reign over you. And the Egyptians pursue them and follow them into that Red Sea, but the story tells us in Exodus that as the army of Egypt were in the middle of that Red Sea, the walls of water closed over them, and they were wiped out. It is a picture for us of what it looks like to move from a life that is governed by the power of sin to step into a land that is governed by the promises of God. And this ocean covers up the thing that was holding them for so long, the thing that was the power over them, the thing that had mastery over them. And yet it wasn't too long later before a number of those Israelites and soon many of them started saying, we want to go back. 
There is that tendency within all of us that when we are suddenly faced with abundant freedom to follow the promises of God, that there are parts of us that just long for the control of sin. But the reality is, church, and Romans 6 is emphasizing for us, this reality, just like was true for those people of Israel, is that there is no going back because there is an ocean between your new life and your old life. So you can imagine the people of Israel coming up, coming back to the, to the Red Sea and saying, hey God, I know it was kind of miraculous when you parted it the first time, wondered if you could do it just one more time. Any of you have little kids, you'll know this phrase a lot, daddy, one last time, okay? One last time, one more time. The absurdity of that, of saying for 400 years we were slaves and now we're separated by this ocean, but we want to go back is, is mirrored only by the absurdity of us choosing sin when Romans 6 says sin no longer has power over you. And so we need to understand, church, that the power of sin has been buried. There is no going back. There is only the promises of God to step into. So this morning, as we look at this together, this is a conversation about dominion and power. This is a conversation about life and death. This is a conversation about whether you and I will choose to live the radical life of crucifixion, death and burial and resurrection, or if we will simply choose to live the shallow life. And so as we step into this first part of crucifixion, Romans 6 says, we joined him in his death, verse 3. We are united with him in his death, verse 5. And verse 6 says, our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ. Now, this is a big deal, this kind of death. See, what Romans 6 doesn't say is you died in your sleep peacefully with Jesus, right? It doesn't say you choked on a pretzel, it all went horribly wrong, No one could do the Heimlich remover, you died with Jesus, right? It says, no, 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 you were crucified with Christ. You died the slave's death. You died the criminal's death. You died the death of the man or the woman who had no rights. You died the death of the man or woman who no one would defend you. And this morning, I want to pause and consider a few of the arenas of the crucifixion of Jesus that might inform what it looks like for us here to step into a crucified life with Him. One of the realities of the crucifixion of Jesus is this. It is, number one, the weight of the cross. Now, the church tradition would teach us something special about this church in Rome. We'll get to that in a moment. But on the day that Jesus was crucified, he is walking up the hill carrying his cross, and he is so beaten and bloodied by what the soldiers had done to him and how they had mocked him that the Roman soldiers pull a man from the crowd and say, you carry his cross. We read of this man in the gospel account that his name is Simon of Cyrene, and it tells us that he was the father of Alexander and Rufus. Now, perhaps that is just some random detail that one of the gospel writers tells us that this man that carried Jesus' cross had two boys named Alexander and Rufus. But church tradition would suggest, and we see it when we come into Romans chapter 16, so 10 chapters later than the passage we're reading this morning, Paul will write a greeting in Romans 16 verse 13. He will say, greet Rufus. And church, the tradition we we see in this, that we can see in our imagination that in that church who is hearing this message about living a crucified life, there is the son of the man who carried his cross. There is the man who could tell that church, my father told me about the weight of that thing. That you and I in our imagination can can consider what Simon of Cyrene would have done when as he was traveling through Jerusalem that day and forced to carry the cross of a man he did not know, that at the top of that cross, at the top of that hill would give the cross back to Jesus, would go home and bring his two boys, Rufus and Alexander, onto his knees and say, boys, I want to tell you about the man who gave his life for us. 
I wanna tell you about the weight of that cross, the ruggedness of that cross. I wanna tell you what it was like when at the top of that hill I got to lay down that cross and he laid himself down on that cross and spread out his hands and was ready to give his life for you and for me. Church, the crucified life is not a shallow life. The crucified life, Jesus will say to his disciples, take up your cross daily and follow me. Understand the weight of it. Understand the ruggedness of it. Understand that there will be times where you are so exhausted you want someone else to carry it. And yet the invitation of the crucified life is to understand that at the top of the hill that he was the one who was crucified. Another element of the crucifixion is this, is that Jesus was falsely accused. See, it's theologically, legally impossible for God to commit blasphemy. And yet that is what Jesus is falsely accused of. He died for a crime that he did not commit. And church, for you and I to step into the crucified life, to say that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ, if we want to step into that reality, we have to be prepared at times to suffer when we are falsely accused. We have to be prepared to surrender our desire to defend ourselves and instead say, God is my sole defender. My reputation will be defended by him. My identity will be defended by him. My deeds will be judged by him and no one else. Third, one of the things that Jesus said from the cross, towards the end of his suffering, Jesus said from the cross, it is finished. In the original text, it just means paid in full. It's this reality that what Jesus was saying is he paid a debt that he did not owe. He paid our debt. He said, it is finished. Now, Jesus didn't say you are finished because the cross was not the end of you. It was the beginning of you. Jesus did not say, I, as in Jesus, I am finished because the cross was not the end of his story. It was merely the continuation of a story that had begun before the foundation of the world. Jesus said, it is finished. What? We see in Romans 6, death no longer has power over him. Sin no longer has power over you. Do not let sin reign over you because it is no longer your master. That is what was finished. And church, too often we continue playing in something as if it continues, and yet God says that ended. It finished at the cross of Calvary. That is what it means to live a crucified life. It means to understand what was ended and understand what was begun. Fourth, the cross is a place of forgiveness. Jesus from the cross said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. If you and I are to live crucified lives with Jesus. Again, church, this is a radical message. If you want shallow, you won't find it in Jesus. But if you want depth, you will find that at his place where he was falsely accused, where he was abandoned, he made it a place of forgiveness. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Church, for you and I this day and this week, if you want to understand and learn what it means to live a crucified life, you have to learn to stop waiting for people to come and ask for forgiveness. Stop waiting to, for people to come and apologize and instead be the kind of person that says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. To step out into the world today and this week and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead with forgiveness because at, at the place of his death at the place of his crucifixion. That is how he spoke. And lastly, the cross is a place of surrender. John, the gospel account in John of Jesus' crucifixion will tell us that he bowed his head and breathed his last. Now, it might seem like a small detail, but when we think about the alternative of, of a, a, a criminal or somebody holding on to their very last breath, they would be holding up their head, holding up their head until the last breath left, and then their head would fall. But in the case of Jesus from the cross, it says he bowed his head as if bowing before God and breathed his last, that he gave his life. He surrendered it. He said in the garden the night before his crucifixion, not my will, but your will be done. 
So church, if you and I are to learn to live in the crucified life place, we have to learn the way of surrender. That crucifixion was the natural conclusion of Jesus surrendering his life to the voice of the Father. Not my will, he said, but your will be done. This is what it means to follow Jesus into crucifixion. It means that like him where his feet were nailed to the cross so he could not go where he wanted to go, his hands were nailed to the cross so he could not do what he wanted to do. That he said, not my will but your will be done. That is what it means, church, to step into the crucified life to choose a life of surrender. Paul will write in Galatians 2 verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If you're anything like me, too many of us are trying to live or, or trying to die these clean, noble deaths, right? Surrounded by applause. And that is not the crucifixion of Jesus. The crucifixion of Jesus is a death of surrender to him. So we're crucified with Christ and then we talk about being buried with Christ. Uh, it says, uh, not only were we crucified with Christ, but verse three says we were buried with Christ in baptism. Verse three will begin by saying, have you forgotten? Right, it's as if Paul is like yelling out to the church, hey, wake up, have you forgotten that you were buried with Christ in baptism? See, in the, in the ancient, to the ancient hearers, those hearing it, Sheol, or this place of death and burial, of course, was a very terrifying place. Still is today, right, for, for many people. Think about how much work and money the ancient Egyptians would spend to try and preserve the, the body of the, the wealthy or the rulers by building the, the, the temples or the, the pyramids and surrounding them with riches and wealth and all of those things, right? It was a place of great terror. Why? Because it's a place where you're covered up with dirt and forgotten. And it says, we were buried with Christ in baptism. Remember this reality of when the people walked through the parted sea, walked through those walls of water surrounded, it was a reminder for them that this death, this burial was about leaving behind the old life and taking hold of the new life. Now in our modern era, sometimes baptism has become uh, for us, um, you know, uh, sort of um, somewhat, blasé or, or just something that we kind of just step into a little bit without putting this deep thought into, but in Romans, to those who would be hearing it, they would be very familiar with this process called catechesis, which was this tradition back then of what it meant when you declared and said, I want him to be my Lord, right? Jesus would say to his disciples, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and yet not do the things that I say? So be very, this is your warning, okay? Be very, very careful before declaring him as your Lord. Because when you do, you step into this radical life that says, I want to be joined with him in death through baptism. But this catechesis process back then that the Romans would have understood as they heard this letter was this months-long process where somebody would say, I want to follow him. I want him to be my rabbi. I choose him as my Lord. I surrender my life to him. And so over a period of weeks and months, they would be learning the ways of Jesus, learning what that means to step into baptism. And then once a year, typically around the Easter time frame, they would, or, or when that was celebrated, there would, of course, be then at the gatherings, these large pools of water, and the men and women would be separated to step into baptism because they would be doing it naked, right? We're trying to bring that back to vintage. Um, <laughs> city codes in Fort Collins make that impossible, but if we, camp, if we uh, plant a campus out in Greeley, it might be allowed, so uh, we're going <laughs> to, we're going to, we're going to try it. That's just a joke, but... Um, <laughs> Or is it, church? Is it? Um, uh, come back in two weeks. Last Sunday of every month we do baptism. You'll find out if that's a joke or not. But, um, but why would they do that, right? It's a, it's a joke. But why would they actually do that back then? Uh, uh, separate the men and women with, with no clothes, etc., and do this. Why? Because it was, a, it was a picture for them of saying, I'm leaving everything behind. 
everything behind and there's a purification to it and there's a stepping into a new life that says, when I come out of that water, now everything I do, every decision I make is filtered through the reality that he is in charge. That sin is no longer my master, he is my master. That I have stepped out from the power of sin and I have stepped into the glorious power of the Father. And I'm saying I'm leaving that old life behind. And I, I'm sinking into this waters of baptism. It's something that the water doesn't have any resistance, but man, my heart has some resistance. My, my mind has some resistance to this idea that I'm surrendering control to the creator of the universe. And somehow, in the absurdity of all, sometimes I think I could do a better job. And yet the invitation of this, when it says that we were buried with him in baptism, is that verse 7 says, when, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. So crucified with Christ, buried with Christ, and then thirdly, raised with Christ. It says in verse 4, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father. So before we dive into that verse, I want to linger for a moment about the literal day of resurrection of Jesus. We, of course, thought about it just a few weeks ago at Easter. But we said, you know, Jesus is crucified, his, his life, and then a man called Joseph of Arimathea goes to Pilate and says, hey, I want his body. And just like Simon of Cyrene had carried the cross of Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea carries the body of Jesus and carries him and lays him into a tomb that hadn't been used before. And then, of course, the authorities get so afraid that Jesus might raise from the dead that they roll a stone, they guard it, they set watch over it. But on the third day, that morning, it says this of the women who went to the tomb. It says that while it was still dark... They went to the tomb. Now, this is a quick side point, but I want to share this with you. Sometimes when we think about running to where Jesus is, we wait until things in our life brighten up. Sometimes we wait until we can clean ourselves up a little bit. Sometimes we wait until we can fix things a little bit. I want to tell you that the women on that third day had it right while it was still dark. So church, if you today, if any of you are feeling a sense of darkness over your life, if you're like, if you're wanting to scream out, you have no idea how dark things are, I want to tell you that the only place in the universe that you need to go to right now is to the empty tomb of Jesus, to find out that he is not there, the living is no longer amongst the dead. And so while it was still dark, they go there to this empty tomb, but See, what is this resurrection about? As we take those 14 verses, and let me just um, merge, let me just sort of edit some of the verses together so you can hear the, the weight of what's going on in these 14 verses. It says this, that, the, that Jesus was raised, why? That sin might lose its power in our lives. That we are set free from the power of sin. That death no longer has any power over him. It says, he died once to break the power of sin. You also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin. Do not let sin control the way you live, for sin is no longer your master. You see how much power is in there? The power of sin, the power of death. Right, this power that is pushing down, that is forcing down. And it says what in verse 4? Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the what? By the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Now, we don't have to be geniuses to understand that glorious power is stronger than power. And the reality is, is that, well, let me tell you this. I, I worked for a couple of months many years ago in Shanghai, uh, teaching English, or at least that's what I thought I was doing. I was getting some nods back and forth, so who knows what was actually being received. But, um, but I remember in Shanghai, uh, there was this, uh, uh, on one of the streets, there was a, a DVD store called Movie World, and then right next to it, another DVD store that was called Even Better Than Movie World. And so it was this great, probably owned, by, you know, whatever, but um, it's not a bad idea, but... Um, but the reality is, is we don't need to be really smart to understand that power has nothing on glorious power. 
And yet, church, too many of us, myself included at times, we choose to live under the power of sin instead of under the glorious power of the Father. And I don't care how dark it is. I don't care how constrained you feel, how much power you have. There is the glorious power that can set you free from that. And so, to again, to read verses 11 to 14, just listen to this. It says this, So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace." The word instrument in that text, the original word is this word hoplon, or it might be pronounced differently, but who cares? Uh, But the word means a tool or an instrument or a weapon. So here's the reality from this passage that we can understand. By the choices you and I make with our minds, our hearts, our bodies, we can either be a weapon that causes wounds to others and self-inflicted wounds to ourselves, or we can choose to be an instrument that creates this beautiful symphony and harmony that brings glory to God. And what Romans 6 is teaching us, and this is again where we have to remember that if we have chosen Him as our Lord, He has a radical message for us, is He's saying you no longer have the excuse to say that you're under the power of sin because you, church, are under the freedom of God's grace. And so that means that we have to come to him and submit to him and say, okay, God, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready to make the right choices. He says, child, I know you are, but first, would you join my son in his crucifixion? Would you join my son in his burial? And at that point, the only thing that can raise you is the glorious power of the Father to give you a new life in Christ. So church, this week, as you and I remember that we are not governed by the law, we are not governed by the power of sin, that we are governed by the glorious power of the Father, we have within us, because of Him, we have the power to choose, to not let sin and death reign over us, but instead to choose Him as our Master and Lord. May we each this week just be reminded of what's true about us. You know, it's so much of the gospel is simply being reminded of what's already happened. Simply being reminded of what Jesus already accomplished. And may we this week be those men and women who choose to say, not my will but yours be done. May we be the kind of people who, where there is forgiveness needed, we would step out and say, Father, forgive them. May we be the kinds of people who choose the crucified life, who choose the buried life, and then choose by the glorious power of the Father to be raised to new life in Him. Let's stand together and pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you together and we worship you for who you are and what you accomplished on our behalf on the cross at Calvary. We, we celebrate together that the tomb is empty. We worship together that you, Father, raised him by your glorious power and we come this morning no longer under the power of sin but under your glorious power of grace and freedom. We love you and we worship you in Jesus' name, amen.